Thank you, Member. Recognizing Saanich North and the Islands, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for. Keep going. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the uh, Forest Statutes Amendment Act. And um, I have a, a number of comments on this bill. And I want to start um, my comments uh, today with raising my hands in gratitude and acknowledgement of the uh, speaker, two speakers back, uh, the member for Prince George Mackenzie. Uh, for those that um, were paying attention, will know a lot more about the history of uh, forestry in this province. And for those that were not, I encourage you to go uh, call the video. And uh, I think that it would be a great teaching tool for, for kids and, and for adults alike in learning how we got to where we're at today, a very honest and, and open approach to, uh, to informing us uh, in this house and, and, uh, and I think for all British Columbians. So I thank the member uh, from uh, Prince George Mackenzie. Um, as anybody who's been paying attention to um, the, the dialogue here in this house would know that I and my colleague, uh, the member for Couch and Valley, have uh, been talking a lot about forestry and forestry practices in this province. And so um, it's, was, it has been with anticipation that we see, uh, finally, the amendments to um, the forest statutes. And it was, I think, two years ago or maybe even three years ago now that many of these changes were put in front of us, but never brought forward uh, in legislation. So it's, it's not like many of these changes that we're seeing in the legislation in front of us right now are new. They were things that the government was considering uh, and then for some reason or another decided to hold off until uh, to, till now to bring the, these, these changes. Certainly, the changes around road building and the regulations and, and rules around where roads can be built and how they can be built uh, were something that was being considered uh, quite a while ago. Um, as has been mentioned by the previous speaker, this, uh, this act replaces forest stewardship plans with 10-year uh, forest landscape plans. Um, it requires uh, the, the government and um, the chief forester to uh, engage with and consult with Indigenous nations. Uh, requires uh, industry developed uh, site level plans to detail specific harvesting and, and building activities. They must align with the forest landscape plans that have been put in place. Uh, allows the chief forester to set stocking standards and focus reforestation in high priority areas. Uh, provides broad regulation, making authority regarding all aspects of the legislation. And uh, for, for much of what's in this legislation, uh, it, it is welcomed. The, the changes are welcomed. However, I think uh, to the points that have been made by previous speakers, the question is, uh, does this legislation go far enough, fast enough? And has been mentioned uh, by my colleague and, and by other, other members, um, the fact that this transition that's being proposed here is going to happen over the next uh, eight to ten years is really an indication of the type of urgency that this government uh, is, is putting behind this, and certainly not to the level that I think that British Columbians want, and certainly uh, not to the level of urgency that I think is necessary in order to protect uh, these really incredible and important um, biodiverse uh, forests that are more than just a uh, resource for us to extract. Uh, they are an home to many, many, countless species that, uh, that British Columbians hold dear. And, uh, and you know, I think uh, one of the comments that I saw made uh, when the government was announcing this was that this was about putting uh, people at the center of forestry policy. And I think that actually what we need is to put the forest at the center of forestry policy um, for so long, people and the values that people extract from forests have been uh, at the center of the decision making. And that's the, part of the reason why we have got to where we're at. The, the bleak picture that the, the member from Prince George Mackenzie painted with respect to basically an unregulated industry that has clear cut most of the, the timber value off the landscape and replaced very little of it. Uh, unfortunately, that is uh, what the result of having people at the center of forestry policy is about. And what we actually need is a government that is going to put those uh, values of the forest, the biodiversity, 
at the center uh, of the decision making. I'm going to, uh, and, and I think one of the things that was mentioned uh, in, in the comments earlier was uh, the, the clause that without unduly reducing the supply of timber as being one of the, 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 the main policies that has, uh, that has uh, I think, the decision makers um, deciding that, that entire forests will be clear cut. And I take a look at this piece of legislation and note, I think it's in section 2.22, or uh, we'll, we'll get into that in the com committee stage, but that in preparing a forest landscape plan, the chief forester must consider the following objectives. A, supporting the production and supply of timber in the forest landscape area. So as much, um, you know, as much has been made about the monumental changes that this government is making in, in the approach to forest, uh, without unduly reducing the supply of timber and supporting the production of supply of timber in the forest landscape area, very, very similar language. Still having the value of the dead tree at the center of our decision making. And I think that it, uh, it means that um, as much as being made of this and the, and the monumental changes that this, uh, that this is, is going to have eight to 10 years from now, uh, the reality at the center of it is um, the supply of timber, dead trees. And that's what British Columbia has valued most uh, in the history of this province is dead stuff, dead fish, dead trees. And so uh, I think that what we need to put at the, back, at the center of this is living things. You know, one of the things that I've talked about often is the, the uh, Kusetnich fishing method, the Shwala, the reef net fishery, uh, is really based around the number of fish that escape and, and make it back to their creeks to spawn. Because our ancestors knew the value of the renewable resource, those fish that come back. And so our shwala, our reef nets, were built, manufactured with holes in them. The culture built or was built around leaving those fish, the first fish at the return of, of the salmon year to, uh, season to head upstream. 10, 15 days before we would start fishing, meaning a whole pile of life is preserved as it heads back up so our relatives up the streams could harvest those fish. And I think that um, one, of the, one of the biggest changes in world view here in British Columbia 160 years ago was where we placed our value. This government places the value in dead stuff. And I think that we've seen in the history of our province a uh, far more uh, renewable and uh, a, a far ba better balanced relationship with nature was when we valued living things. And I, and I think that we, we can do that. And we can, and it wasn't that the indigenous nation, my ancestors, didn't develop resources. We were incredible resource developers. We just had our value set uh, and our worldview uh, different than the one that's here now far more uh, resilient and, and, um, and uh, renewable resource when, when you shift that worldview. I do want to talk about the Indigenous consultation piece of this. I heard the Minister earlier talking about uh, Indigenous consultation and, and uh, how one of the, I think, hallmarks of this piece of legislation is that, is that um, we're ch changing, the, the, the Minister's proposing to change uh, the rules that the chief forester must follow when in consulting and developing a consultation plan uh, in cooperation with Indigenous peoples. And my colleague, the member for Couch and Valley, mentioned this earlier, that while the government's giving themselves eight to ten years to transition from the current situation that we have in our forests to the future of forests in this province, uh, the, the, the same minister that is, that is celebrating this is giving Indigenous nations exactly 60 days to, uh, to respond to requests from the chief forester. So on one hand, the government's taking eight to 10 years, and on the other hand, they're giving indigenous nations just a mere two months. And you know, all, you know, each 60-day period isn't created equally, of course, because uh, for those of us who grew up in indigenous communities and, and understand indigenous communities across the province, we know 
that if that consultation happens in the summertime, as an example, uh, that it is a much different uh, time to consult with Indigenous nations than if the consultation was to happen in the fall or the, or the winter uh, or even early spring. And indeed, if you, uh, if you were to uh, be paying attention to the, to the work of the First Nations Forestry Council, one of the things that they uh, said in a letter that they wrote uh, to the Premier uh, back in September, admonishing this government for its flawed uh, and um, its flawed process, engagement process. The engagement process uh, that was being undertaken by this ministry, this ministry that's, that's uh, claiming success in, uh, in Indigenous consultation, uh, was being expedited, quote, during a time of crisis due to wildfires, right in the middle of summer. This government's rushing consultation on the uh, implementation of, of the, um, the intention paper for modernizing forest policy in BC. Rolling out Indigenous consultation right in the busiest time of year, and not only, not only the busiest time of year traditionally, but also the busiest time of year due to the fact that many Indigenous nations, uh, entire territories were on fire. At the same time, they're expected to engage with this government on modernizing forestry. A process which I should point out is uh, been really frustrating considering the fact uh, that uh, the intention paper and the consultation that this government has been undertaking, uh, quote, does not mention or reflect many actions and priority areas of work outlined in the BC First Nations Forest Strategy. The ministry has ignored the input First Nations provided for over a decade regarding changes needed to inform and guide the implementation of the Declaration Act to reflect our rights, legislate joint decision-making, including the current forest revenue sharing model. September 8th, this letter was, was sent in. And on October uh, 26th, we have the minister standing in this house claiming success in consultation and that this legislation was drafted in cooperation and consultation with Indigenous nations and uh, Indigenous leadership groups. So quite clearly, the definition of engagement and consultation for this government is different than the expectations uh, with Indigenous uh, leadership. And the groups that have been given the, uh, the job of, of negotiating on behalf and working on behalf of, of uh, Indigenous nations, and this, was, this letter was signed by 22 or 25 or something uh, Indigenous nations that have uh, forestry interests in this province. So, um, 60 days, as I mentioned, this, uh, this legislation is going to give 60 days for, uh, for Indigenous nations to respond to a consultation, a letter of engagement sent by the Chief Forester. Uh, the Chief Forester must offer to meet with an Indigenous governing body that provides notice of its lack of consent and attempt to achieve consensus. Uh, the Chief Forester uh, can appoint a facilitator for dispute resolution. Uh, the report of the facilitator does not limit the power of the chief forester in respect of, so even if the facilitator says, well, you know what, we, we, uh, we, we land, on the side of the land on the side of the indigenous nation in this one, the chief forester can still utilize their power uh, to proceed. Um, and, uh, and so in taking a look at the measures that are being put in place, certainly there are more than are there now. And I, you know, I think that uh, if we are going to celebrate anything, let's celebrate the fact that there's something there. Uh, and you know, there wasn't anything there in, in previously. So I guess uh, incrementalism and an incremental step forward uh, is better than nothing. Uh, in, the, uh, in the news release uh, of October 20th last week, um, it says, through the development of forest landscape plans, the amendments will create new opportunities for shared decision-making between the government and First Nations. This is aligned with government commitments to implement the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act passed in 2019. Um, this is not, the, the model that has been put in this act is not shared decision-making. It's the same colonial approach, just now it's enshrined in law and not, and not uh, something that the government does on its own accord in order to ensure that Ferry Creek doesn't happen. And even with the process in the past, the, the Ferry Creek did happen. So the reality of it is, is that this government is trying to pass off in its news releases and in all the rhetoric, and when the Premier stands up and the Minister stands up and the people celebrate it, that this is shared decision-making. 
It's not shared decision making. This is a notification from the government. In fact, in fact, um, uh, the minister is quoted in a Business in Vancouver article as saying uh, that uh, the government describes it as a framework for, quote, repositioning government as land manager. Repositioning government as land manager, which I think is a remarkably different approach than one in which is a shared decision-making model. In fact, you know, I think that if I read this uh, to my chief, I said, look, you know, the government is, is moving this uh, shared decision-making model ahead, uh, and, um, and it is uh, repositioning government as land manager, I think that there would be confusion as to, as to how that can be the case. How do you have a shared decision-making model where the provincial government is acting as land manager? Now, it is true that the process that has been in place up until this, this legislation is that we've basically shopped out the work to industry. And so maybe we're bringing it back into government, but certainly you can't stand and say that this is a, an, a remarkable step forward in shared decision-making when if you actually read the, the clauses in this, in this act, it's not a shared, there's nothing in this act that talks about revenue sharing. There's, it's, it's completely void of that. Basically what it says is, look, that consultation model which many Indigenous nations have complained about for decades, we're going to enshrine that into the law. After passing the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act, we're going to enshrine the thing that we didn't like uh, into this new law. It says here, uh, it primarily gives Indigenous voices back to managing the forests on their traditional territory. It gives Indigenous people and Indigenous leadership the right to comment early on in a process. And, and I, I guess that could, be, that could be construed as being uh, voices back to managing their forests. However, it's not a collaborative process. Nowhere in this legislation does it outline where an Indigenous nation can come forward with their own operational landscape plan or how the interests of the nation can be uh, put together in, in uh, landscape management planning, how that, work, uh, how that work's gonna be resourced, how it is that the provincial government is working with Indigenous nations within their territory. In fact, you know, the Premier has stood so often recently and talked about Indigenous rights and title, the title holders, the owners of the land, that's not what's reflected in this legislation that the Premier's Minister of Forest is bringing forward. That's convenient language that the Premier can use in order to befuddle and confuse the public. That's not the framework that this legislation is putting forward. In fact, this legislation is, it is indeed doing exactly what the Minister says, which is bringing the control back into the provincial government. Now, perhaps that's one step closer for Indigenous nations, but it certainly, it certainly does not reflect the rhetoric of our Premier. And, you know, he takes cover uh, with that rhetoric, but, uh, you know, I think that it's important to acknowledge that um, a, 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 a framework that reflects the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act is one that is collaborative, that allows Indigenous people to take, some, the, to take the, the leadership at the front end, uh, to, to approach the chief, there's nowhere in this that says that, that uh, or encourages the chief forester uh, to, to do anything but bring forward the Crown Forestry Policy to Indigenous nations, gives them 60 days in order to respond to it. If they don't, you know, you want to proceed with, uh, with caution, but it still puts the power right in the hands of the provincial government. You know, and I think that it's in stark contrast to actually what we passed when we pass the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, and we often refer to it in this place, but it's not very often that we actually refer to the articles of the Declaration Act to remind the members of government what we passed when we made the commitment to Indigenous nations. Article 3, the right to self-determination. Article 4, exercise the right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs. This would give Indigenous nations the ability to generate their own forestry plans. Nowhere in, in this act, and I look forward to talking to the minister about how the actual Declaration Act comes to life, where life is being breathed into that in this legislation. Article 8, uh, 
State shall provide a me mechanisms for the prevention of and redress for B, any action which has the aim or effect of dispossessing them of their lands, resources, and territories. Government at the center of the decision making around forests. I'm wondering how that applies. Article 18. Indigenous people have the right to participate in decision making in matters which should affect their rights through representatives chosen by themselves in accordance with their own procedures as well as to maintain and develop their own Indigenous decision making institutions. What's being outlined in this is a framework that the government is establishing with not, and not taking into consideration the numerous nations in this province and their own decision making processes. You know, and I, 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 th I recognize that that's, that that's challenging. But that's the commitment that this government made, and that's the commitment that progressive governments in this country are making. Is it, it's a commitment to Indigenous nations to sit down and create a process that works for them, based on the fact that the entire lens with which we view the relationship with Indigenous people has changed, and rightfully so. Article 19, states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with Indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. The, this legislation gives the chief forester the ability to proceed even if there's not the consent from, from my reading of it. So, you know, I think, again, uh, it's important that, uh, that we reflect on what it is that we've committed to. Um, Article 26, Indigenous people have the right to the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used or acquired. This government has been using uh, forest and range consultation and revenue sharing agreements uh, pretty liberally. I think there's 140 of them. Uh, and, you know, in this province, and certainly uh, they've been signed by Indigenous nations. I understand that. Uh, however, the, the fact remains that uh, the, the, the members of this government's caucus, or former members of, this, of the government's caucus, have rightfully called these agreements take-it-or-leave-it agreements. In other words, the framework with which we have been operating is that we're going to cut those trees, and you can either be with us and get something, or you can be against us and take us to court, and by the time that you're ready to go, the trees will be gone. It's an incredibly difficult and challenging scenario for communities that uh, want to have decision-making and access to resources to be able to, um, to work in those parameters. Certainly challenging the idea of free prior and informed consent, considering the fact that basically it's Crown forestry policy. And in, that, in those agreements, it enshrines Crown forestry policy. What happens to those agreements uh, in this, when this bill is passed? It would be a question that I'm hoping to get uh, an answer for. Um, because, you know, so many of the, the laws and, and policies that we have in place now are in direct contradiction to the commitments that we've made. So I think that uh, what's really important uh, to recognize here is that um, there is a change being made and the change is is uh, a step forward. However, what's being proposed in this legislation uh, is still, in, in, in my assessment, um, far, far from what we have committed to when we committed to a, um, a different relationship with uh, Indigenous people in this province. Uh, a relationship that, um, in which uh, Indigenous nations uh, have the ability to determine their own futures, uh, not in 60 days, not when the chief forester has it uh, in their mind to advance uh, a, a cut block or advance a, a forest license and gives a nation 60 days to respond. That's a very, very colonial approach to, uh, to, um, to decision making. That's not, that's not shared decision making. Um, and in, in nowhere does it say where the chief forester must engage and work with Indigenous nations that are bringing forward their own management plans over their territories. We've seen that. In fact, we heard from the Squamish. We heard from the Quagyal. 
We've, uh, we've, we've heard from, we've, we've seen now the Gitanya uh, create an um, uh, indigenous uh, protected area. Where was the province? Talking to their neighbors, that's where the province was. In that article uh, that was published, the province didn't show up to the, uh, to the announcement of the, of the um, indigenous protected area. Instead, they were meeting with the neighbors. Wonder why they're doing that. That's a tactic that they've always been playing. You know, the psychists have, have, have laid out very clearly, you're not, you, you can't log in our territory into, if, unless you are, uh, unless you're following uh, these values and they've, they've outlined uh, their values. Where in this legislation is there accommodation for these nations that are standing up and saying, we truly, the, the government, the premier himself, and in fact, I think it was the psychists who said, we heard what the premier said around, uh, in, in, his, in the press conferences around uh, the conflict that's happening in Ferry Creek, and we realize that there's an opportunity for us to stand up. He talked about rights and title holders, the owners of the land, sovereignty. And so that's what they've, that's what they've said, is they've said, look, like, uh, we, we are now uh, exercising that. And where in this legislation, this reformation, this, this uh, celebrated, we're, we're engaging with Indigenous nations unlike we've ever done before, where in this legislation does it accommodate for Indigenous nations that are stepping up uh, to do that? I'm, I'm very interested in asking uh, the Minister about that. So all in all, I think that, um, you know, there is an Im important uh, um, update to these laws. I think it is important that, uh, that we take control and get control over the road construction that's happening uh, on the landscape. We, we know that that's having devastating impact for uh, wildlife. And, uh, and you know, with, with no regulation of roads, well, you can just imagine what happens on the landscape. Our, our friend and, and member from uh, um, Prince George Mackenzie talked a lot about that. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to this legislation. and. Um, I look forward to the debate uh, in uh, the committee stage. And with that, I'll take my seat. Hi, Skasiam.